Welcome back to Module 2 and to Chapter 4. This is the first of two videos that will cover the phases of the moon portion of the chapter. In this first video, we're going to get across some of the big picture ideas about how the moon works. And in the second video is when we get to a lot of the terminology that we'll need and kind of pushing our critical thinking a little bit more. So what I want to start out with is a check to see where our current understanding is, because phases of the moon, very similar to seasons, is both taught in K through 12 curriculum and has a lot of misconceptions in the general population. So we want to make sure to confront those and fix any prior misunderstanding we have. So let's start with a pause and think question based on your understanding before this class. So it's fine if you haven't read the book, and this is certainly the first time that we're seeing it in the lecture videos, but based on your prior understanding, what causes the moon to have different phases? As you read through these, some of them might feel more silly than others. Some of them you might be struggling to decide between. The correct answer, which we will understand a lot better after this video and the next, is option four here. But the common incorrect answer is option two. I need you to write down in all capital letters in your notes, if you chose option two, that the phases are not caused by Earth's shadow. Don't feel bad that you have that common misconception. If we went up and asked anyone on the street, more likely than not, that's what they would say. But we're taking this class in order to fix that misunderstanding and make sure that we have the correct ideas. So we need to make sure to get rid of that incorrect idea right away. Okay, so by the end of this set of videos, this one and the next, what I want you to be able to do and feel confident in doing is if you glance and see the moon in the sky, I want you to be able to figure out what name to call it. We're gonna have all of that terminology in the second of the two videos, but I want you to be able to recognize it by sight. What I also want you to be able to do is to know what the moon is going to look like in a couple of days. So that implies not only knowing what phases are called, but knowing the order in which they happen. And to really push our critical thinking, I want us to recognize that if we see the moon in the sky and know what direction we're facing, that we should be able to figure out approximately what time it is based on the phase of the moon and the direction that we're facing. So this video is gonna start out with a couple of common misconceptions and lay the groundwork for that more detailed second video. The first thing I want to confront is this idea of the dark side of the moon. This is a phrase that typically is used to suggest that the moon has a single side that is always hidden from sunlight, is always dark. So along with our main goals, we want to investigate this claim and some of its implications. Okay, so before we do that, I want us to think about this picture here. It's one of my favorite in all of astronomy, and honestly, it's one of my favorite photographs of all time. It's called Earthrise, and this particular one is from 1968, when the Apollo 8 mission was in an orbit around the moon, and the Earth came into view as they were orbiting. If we look at the Earth in this picture right now, we can see some of it is lit up, and some of it is dark because we know that the Earth is supposed to be round looking because it's a sphere. And so the shape that we're seeing is coming from the fact that we can see some of the lit up side and some of the dark side. Now for the Earth, when we're glancing at it, the people who are on the lit up side are experiencing daytime. And the people who are on the dark side are experiencing nighttime. And we recognize that half of the Earth is always gonna be lit up and half of it's always gonna be dark and people can experience daytime and nighttime over a single 24 hour period. Now, this idea that half of the object is always lit up by the sun is true on the moon also. So half of the moon is always lit up. What we wanna make sure we understand is whether it's always the same half or whether there's a change the way that there is on Earth. 
On Earth, every 24 hours, the dark side is changing because the Earth rotates on its axis. So we want to figure that out about the moon also. All right. This set of images is the same face of the moon, and we can tell that by looking at the general pattern of the light and dark sides. And I want us to see how the lit up part is changing from our point of view on the ground on Earth. Now, first of all, before we go any further, this leftmost shape of the moon. I want you to draw that in your notes. Be careful to note how the um, shape really looks. That leftmost shape cannot possibly be made by the Earth's shadow. So this misconception that we build for ourselves is because we're only ever really thinking about a crescent shape, but the one on the left here we're gonna eventually learn is called a gibbous moon. And I want us to be able to recognize that that shape cannot be made by Earth's shadow. Okay, but moving along, if we wanted to build a house on the moon, that would be pretty cool. I'd be willing to live on the moon if I could see the Earth um, all the time. I'm going to highlight for us a pair of craters in every single image. So on the left, those craters are fully lit up. Um, and if we built our house right in the middle of one of those craters, it, we would be experiencing daytime on that leftmost moon. In the middle image, we can start to see the shadows changing in the craters. So if we built our house in there, we would start to see the sun leaving our view because we're no longer getting as much sunlight as we used to. And in the third image where I've drawn that same highlighted circle, we no longer see those craters and that's because they are darkened. They are no longer in sunlight. So our house in that crater would be experiencing a change from light to dark, which means there is no single dark side on the moon. Now, I want us to think instead now, instead of building a cool house, we decide to build this massive arrow to represent a visible pattern on the moon's surface. Now, let me go back a slide real quick. I want to remind us that what we have seen over this set of moon images is that the same pattern is facing the Earth every time. So with that in mind, which situation fits that statement that we can always see the same pattern? In part A, the moon is not rotating, and so the arrow is pointing towards the Earth, then sideways, then away from the Earth, then sideways. And in B, the arrow is pointing towards the Earth at all points. And in part B, the moon is rotating. So, pause if you need to ponder it, reread the words on the slide, rewind if you need to hear me ask the question again. But the fact that we can always see the same pattern on the moon means we are in the situation B here. The moon does rotate. So what we've figured out so far, this is a kind of important recap of what we've been able to cover with just a couple of images and pointing out what we're looking at. The moon is always half illuminated by reflected sunlight. The moon does not create its own light in the same way that Earth is not creating its own light when we see it lit up in images. It's sunlight that is shining on half of the Earth. Sunlight is shining on half of the moon. Now, the portion of the moon that is lit up changes over the course of the lunar cycle, which means there's no single dark side. And that phrase, dark side of the moon, doesn't represent a specific area of the moon that is always dark. That doesn't happen. And one thing that may be tougher to think about, but really sit with it and draw it out if you need to, the moon does rotate on its axis as it orbits the Earth, so that it is always able to point the same face towards us. There is a single far side of the moon and a single near side of the moon. Now the last point here is not a coincidence. It's actually due to a um, physical process called tidal locking. We do not need to fully understand tidal locking to be able to um, just accept that statement. 
And to fully understand it, we would have to go into the math and physics that is beyond the scope of our course. But I do want to point it out that it isn't just a coincidence for us. So since we've mentioned tidal locking, I want to talk about tides a little bit. They aren't really as key to our curriculum, but I do want to think about some of the big picture ideas for tides. Now, tides come from the fact that our large oceans on the surface of Earth can slosh around based on the force of gravity between the moon and the Earth and the sun and the Earth. When we have high tide and low tide, what we are experiencing is the portion of the Earth that we're standing on moves through the kind of alignment with the moon and then moves away from it because the water is able to be pulled based on the force of gravity, but the Earth still has to rotate. And so in the image on the right, it is a simplified animation, but it does show us that the water is responding to the force of gravity, but Earth still has to kind of rotate underneath that, which is why we get high tide and low tide um, every single day. They aren't necessarily the same highest high tide and lowest low tide, and the reason for that is because the sun also has an effect too. So when we have a new moon or a full moon, the tides are really strong because in the top portion here, it's called spring tides, we don't need that term, but for full moon or new moon, the water's kind of getting squashed out side to side here. And with the sun being aligned the way that it is, it is also getting squashed out in the same kind of way. Tides are weakest, and by weakest we mean there's the smallest change from high tide to low tide. There's just very little change on those days at the first quarter and third quarter moons. And we'll be exploring those terms in more detail in the next video. But the moon is trying to pull the water in one direction, and the sun is trying to pull it in the opposite direction. And so those, those two factors are kind of fighting each other in a way. We don't need to memorize the spring tides and neap tides, and really the only major reason why I include this slide is because there are a lot of misconceptions or pseudoscientific beliefs about how the full moon affects humans or affects animals that has to do with the water in our bodies, or there's lots of different things about how full moon affects people. But anything where that pseudoscientific belief is talking about the water and the tides and anything else, never do those pseudoscientific beliefs mention new moon because the new moon's not visible in the sky and so it's not as memorable. If you have some um, weird situation that happens and you notice that it's a full moon, you'll probably store that information. But if you have that same weird situation happen, and it's a first quarter moon or it's a crescent moon, you might not even notice the moon and so you wouldn't store the information in that same way. A lot of these pseudoscientific beliefs get built up because of confirmation bias and not because of any real scientific connections. So something to be aware of and we'll probably talk about that more in the discussion boards. All right, so back to tidal locking. Because the Earth spins faster than the moon orbits, there is this small transfer of angular momentum, which means the Earth is slowing down a tiny portion of a second every year, and the moon is moving farther away, a small portion of a meter every year. And so eventually, the long-term effect would be that the Earth is also tidally locked to the moon. So instead of having a day, which is 24 hours, and a month, which is um, 30 days, we would end up with a single number value that represents both a day and a month. Kind of interesting. We don't need to memorize this or, or fully understand it for our curriculum, but I thought it was worth noting. If you have questions about it, certainly um, bring them up in the discussion boards. It is a really cool idea. It's just one that we can't really get into. Um, as much as as much as we might want. There is a um, simulation here that uses um, Adobe Flash, so it's not that accessible, um, but if you do have access to it um, and you click on the posted slides, um, then you will be able to see how turning the effect of the sun on and off 
actually shows you how, um, how this process might work. So that's it for this first video. The second one is really where we build our new uh, terminology and really push our critical thinking skills. But this video kind of gets out all of the other key things out of the way so we can focus just on that in the next video. So I will see you then.